Uh, I think it's useful to begin with a bit of context about the North Sea and some of the effects of COVID-19. Since the start of the UK North Sea oil and gas development in the mid-1960s, the industry has received substantial state support. Tax arrangements have been built on liberalization and company profits. The UK has reduced its sovereignty over resources and doesn't benefit from taxing the industry or experience the expected reinvestment that they use to justify their decisions. They've pushed the development of North Sea oil with absolutely no regard for the financial future of taxpayers contractually bound to pay decommissioning costs. COVID-19 and the oil crisis has been more than anything else a stark reminder of how precarious livelihoods are. Um, at the moment, Rysat Energy is estimating that more than 1 million workers who provide oil field services will likely lose their jobs in 2020. In terms of the North Sea workforce, there's been a growing number of layoffs and employers have brought in hiring freezes. At the height of COVID-19, all non-essential work was canceled and companies have cut down to a skeleton crew. Not only does this mean thousands of layoffs, but it also suggests dangerous health and safety standards. If we look to the last oil crisis as an indicator of what's to come, over 150,000 workers in the supply chain lost their jobs. In order to talk about what a transition in the industry looks like and building resiliency within energy intensive communities, we need to understand that cyclical price shocks will continue if, if we're unwilling to examine the tax breaks and support that the oil industry receives with literally no public control and minimal trade union presence. With this understanding then, we can start to look at what we mean when we say just transition. I think the definition of a just transition is at best vague when it comes to specific policy requirements for workers in the oil and gas industry or what makes that in particularly just. Frequently, transition proposals come from NGOs or government bodies who've never consulted the workers they would affect. I'd like to frame the argument for a worker-led transition and the need for working class ecological politics. As many of us demanding a green recovery from COVID-19 understand, we must confront the wealthiest and most powerful sectors of capital in order to build a sustainable future. Carbon intensive sectors of capital will not sit by and allow the revolutionary changes needed. What we fundamentally need is a highly organized social movement with a mass base behind it to force capital and the state to make changes. In most of its current iterations, environmental politics won't be able to do this. Its ideological and strategic orientation reflects a worldview that centers educational credentials and the knowledge of the environmental crisis. Middle class environmental politics is often directly antagonistic to working class interests. It grounds its theories of ecological responsibility in the idea of ecological or carbon footprints that blames consumers and workers for their consumption. In reality, decades of neoliberal policy have left working class communities feeling anything but guilty or complicit for their emissions. Rather, they feel constrained by severe limits on access to the basics for survival. We must offer a different story of class responsibility for the ecological crisis and offer a political program that directly appeals to the material interests of the vast majority of the population. This doesn't have to be difficult, and it's what many calls for a Green New Deal or a Green Recovery are doing. The climate crisis is centered on sectors vital to working class survival anyways, like food and energy and transport. But we have to build a movement that takes these critical sectors under public ownership and decar decarbonizes and decommodifies them. We must listen to workers in affected communities and be prepared to structure environmental demands about what workers want. We have to confront the anti-environmentalism within established trade unions and fossil fuel workers head on and build a movement that looks secure and beneficial to them. In the attempt to do any of this, it's first important to define what we mean by a just transition and what policies we should be advocating for. A just transition requires the inclusion of oil and gas workers in any substantial decision making. This is not workers only having the opportunity to present evidence or only union officials allowed a seat at the table. It means participatory involvement by significant portions of the oil and gas workforce to produce binding policy recommendations. Communities on the front lines are often left out of generating solutions. We all remember what coal looked like. And when they are, it fails to deliver justice. Workers have the right to plan their futures and any successful granular modeling requires their input. Any proposal's legitimacy rests on their involvement. This looks like the revitalization of trade union membership and organizing with rank and file encouraged to submit motions within their unions related to transition planning. It also means examining how the larger unions must be democratized to facilitate worker control. Strengthening trade union organization, particularly at the local branch level, will be fundamental to workers being prepared to protect themselves. It also looks like the environmental movement frontlining the perspectives and needs of oil and gas workers. It should be impossible for us to talk about renewables without tackling the issues related to work conditions, particularly for migrant labor, the lack of unionization, and the loss of manufacturing contracts overseas. 
A just transition isn't changing our energy source from oil to wind. It's a total restructuring of energy production and use, a dismantling of the private control over energy, and recentering the power in the hands of workers and communities. If we, look, if we now look at a transition policy with this framework in mind, we can look to see change, which is a report that Platform released with OCI and FOE Scotland last year. The report shows that with the right investment, job creation in clean energy industries would exceed affected oil and gas jobs by more than threefold. To stay within the carbon bu budget, we basically have the choice of, uh, to either start phasing out oil and gas drilling now or wait until later and take drastic action when the industry collapses and leaves workers stranded. Operating within a narrow framework of jobs is a finite resource. The question of whether climate transition creates enough jobs, the question is whether climate transition creates enough jobs in compatible industries. To answer this question, see change models how many jobs can be created in wind energy, marine renewables, and energy efficiency retrofits over the next 30 years. If government don't do anything else to support these industries to expand in the UK, there are some jobs in wind, but not many. If we hit ambitious targets currently proposed by some policymakers and industry, there's over 100,000 new jobs. And in a future where the UK is fully powered by renewables by 2050, there's over 140,000 new jobs in these industries. Government has to act to make this happen, and sea change has some suggestions about how to do this. Scotland has done some of them. National Investment Banks is one, and the Scottish National Investment Bank has been established but isn't lending money yet. Public energy companies is another, and the Scottish government has committed to having this up and running in 2021. As a Just Transition Partnership has pushed for, it must have a bigger role than just acting as another retail end supplier. Other recommendations are local supply chain support, with government requiring companies to manufacture things locally, upgrading ports, and retooling supply chains. Other recommendations include that transition plans should be accountable to workers and communities, governments that jo jobs that are lost should have new ones created with equivalent terms and conditions, transitioning workforces should be free, should have free access to and paid time off for education, fully paid for voluntary relocation or retraining where workers request it, pension protection and wage protection for a minimum of five years where matching salaries can't be secured. That's a lot, I know, but it's all very important. <laughs> but again, Basically, none of this can be done without strong unions. So repealing, repealing anti-trade union legislation, limiting rights to strike and collective bargaining will be crucial. We must remember that, remember that companies aren't even required to pay minimum wage past 12 miles offshore. A lot of these ideas are incorporated in government language around a green recovery, but what we should really look at is where power is held. We must criticize who is on advisory boards and demand not only advice from trade union and civil society groups, but binding recommendations. Even looking toward the Just Transition Commission, so far it's been heavily dominated by industry representatives. The commission's interim report was good and called out rhetoric on a just transition, highlighted the decades of failed job growth and renewables, and talked about how ministers must be more interventionist and willing to take on corporate interests. But I'd remind everyone that big investment or stimulus isn't inherently socially beneficial, and the mere presence of trade union officials doesn't equate worker involvement in decision making. Platform, along with Friends of the Year Scotland and Greenpeace, have recently released a survey for oil and gas workers. The uptake's been amazing, with mostly offshore workers answering questions about the effect of COVID-19, what they want from their energy transition, and what their worries are. I won't share the survey results with you right now, and it's, I'm almost done my time anyways, <laughs> but I would urge everyone to constantly question what the word justice means in a just transition. While we can demand that the government implement sweeping policy changes and job guarantees, we need workers leading that charge. They hold the power to demand those changes. And if, for instance, we find out that 70% of workers in the oil and gas industry want a job guarantee for COVID recovery, that holds massive legitimacy for campaigning. I'd encourage the Just Transition Commission to look into conducting its own mass consultation of oil and gas workers, both directly employed offshore and onshore. Ultimately, the jobs are there, sea change has shown that, but organized labor, public control over energy, and binding participatory consultation will determine whether a transition looks like justice for affected communities. And I slid in with 20 seconds left, so thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabby. That was amazing. And I really appreciate the, uh, the self-facilitation there. I didn't even need to do anything. I'm not needed here. Um, but for now, it'd be great to hear from Craig. Okay, I'll just get my screen sharing and hopefully you can all see this. Is that coming through okay? Yep, brilliant. Right, so uh, for folk who don't know 
uh, uh, myself and uh, Commonweal. We are a, a Glasgow-based uh, uh, think and do tank, we call ourselves, because we are uh, concerned just as much with the practical implementation of our policies as we are with just putting out papers. I say Glasgow-based, but I guess we're home-based now, um, which has been quite an interesting adaptation, but um, it's... it's that has some positives as well as negatives. Uh, I'm going to talk today about um, a paper we published last week and a paper that we're going to publish at the end of this week um, on the topic of resilience economics. This is our, our new campaign for a recovery plan uh, for, for Scotland, for the planet, for our economy, uh, not just in the industry but right across the sec uh, all sectors. Um, because Within this COVID crisis right now, we are, we are facing the, the deepest recession probably that we've ever seen. The details of it are, are going to be unique, um, but we've been here before. In 1997, Gordon Brown promised the end of boom and bust. We've had three recessions since then, the, the dot-com bubble, the, the 2008 financial crisis, and now this. Each time we hit the ground and we rebuild, sometimes we fix the one thing that went wrong. It's quite interesting that the banks and financial system have so far survived COVID better than they did 2008, although there's signs that that could be changing soon. Mostly we just hate, wait for the next crisis to hit. Um, and we have more to come. Um, we, if you think about previous crises, as tides coming in, going out, the big one is coming, the climate emergency is going to be more like sea level rise. The tide is coming in with that. It's going to be major and permanent changes. The, the tide won't go back out again. So we need to build our economy, not just that it helps avoid that catastrophe, but is also resilient to it and to future crises to, to prevent them and to both withstand them. So back in 2019, Commonweal published uh, our plan for a Green New Deal for Scotland. It was, we believe it was the first fully costed blueprint for a Green New Deal. Um, we are now looking at what has changed since then with the COVID crisis and, and what we need to do as a result of the COVID crisis to rebuild our economy and start us on that path to get to that Green New Deal. Um, so we, we published this paper, Resilience Economics, last, last week. What do we mean by resilience? We need economic resilience. We need to make sure the economy doesn't just keep falling down every time it gets knocked. We need social resilience so that when knocks happen, they don't land disproportionately on the people who are least able to cope with it. And we need environmental resilience because it doesn't matter how much value you generate for your shareholders, if you kill your planet, you know, it's, it's pointless. Um, our paper goes into the principles that we should be looking at as we rebuild our economy coming out of this crisis. We should be looking at sufficiency and security. Do we have enough of what we need to have a decent life? Does everybody have enough to, to, to do that? Our core motto at Commonweal is all of us first. A society is only as strong as the weakest member within it. This also means that you, you know, folk can't have too much because that, that could mean pulling away that sufficiency from other people. It also means that we need security of that sufficiency, because if you've got enough today, but you don't know if you, you'll have enough tomorrow, then you're, you're not going to live you know, a, a, a sustainable life. That takes us into the, the next principle, well-being. Our economy should be there to make us happier and healthier and, and be able to lead you know, just lives. If it makes us richer but sick and miserable, again, it's failing. We need cooperation. This crisis has proven more than anything that society works in ways that isolated individualism doesn't. We need diversity. So if one sector fails, like the oil sector, then it shouldn't break everything and everyone. Participation. Craig, if, sorry? sorry? Sorry, Craig. I've only just noticed yeah. because we've gone off um, screens with just the images, but the presentation's only showing sort of half. I can see the picture, but I can't see the text. And I think there's a few people having the same, I don't know if you can... Oh, that's very unfortunate. I'm sorry about that. Come in and come back out. Sorry. It just came up in the chat box there. Which is very unfortunate considering the, the, the image was the least, uh, least interesting part of those slides. How's that? Um, yeah, I mean, I can see that. I don't know about anyone else. I'd like to double check. It's not on full screen, but it's um, on full screen. 
How's that? That's better than it was. Although there's a, I'm not sure if anyone else can see the black block. Do you have a black block, a black a black block on your screen? It's a bit confusing to describe. Yeah, that's it. It's gone now. That was it. That that black block was my thumbnails of everybody else watching. <laughs> I've, I've shoved oh, it down to the bottom. Okay. Uh, I don't um, even know how to close that. Who's that? That's great. I think we can see most of the tank now. Um, right. Paused your time, so don't worry. This this is the disadvantage with doing these virtual conferences is everybody has to learn this tech and you. <laughs> um, but once we all become experts, I, I actually hope we can fit, we can keep some of this once everyone goes back to sort of quote unquote normal or better. Hey, right, where was I? Participation. Um, yeah, if we let just a few people design our, our economy on the rebound, it will be built for them, not for everybody. We all need to be involved, as was said in the last presentation. Everybody affected by the changes coming to various sectors has to be involved uh, in its rebuilding or its transformation. Uh, this is linked to transparency. When when we give our economic design to just a few people, they really hate to see to see what they're doing with it, you know, or for us to see what they're doing with it. So we need to we need we need that government transparency. Um, opportunity, you know, if we just have people who are resigned to their lot in life who cannot change the direction of their life, are we, do we have an economy that's any better than feudalism, really? Um, Decentralisation, we need to be building from the bottom up. We need to be building in, in localised ways. We can't just build at people. You can't just say, right, here's your new economy, on you go, endure it. Uh, the the next thing we need to do is once we set things going, we need to make sure it's working. So that means measurements of the economy, and, and plenty of people have talked about the the end of GDP and how we go beyond GDP and all uh, uh, what we could measure instead. We are we are big fans of the Wellbeing Economics Alliance here and and, and other groups like them. So we've laid out our, our metrics in the Resilience Economics papers, things around sufficiency, usefulness extraction and waste creation rate because we need a circular economy this this goes into you know if we're constantly extracting finite resources we will run out um democratic control again you know allowing people to have that participation and that agency in the economy and regeneration rate our our impact on the the world should be helping the world to heal rather than destroying it even just remaining neutral on this is no longer sufficient because we've already done too much damage to the planet. We need to start repairing. And you'll notice that in that list, GDP growth isn't there, not even with the, 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 the nice adjectives like inclusiveness or green or sustainable growth. Growth might happen as a part of these plans, but it shouldn't be the point of our economy. So the next steps, I mentioned that that was last last week's paper, Nick, this week's paper out on Friday. Um, if you keep an eye on the Commonweal website, commonweal.scot, we're going to take those principles and apply them to a blueprint and a roadmap for Scotland um, that will take us out of this COVID crisis. So the first part is going to be a, a one-year plan that takes us uh, out of lockdown and, and, and deals with the acute problems right now and takes us up to the, the Holyrood elections next year. We then have a five-year plan that takes us through that, that Scottish Parliament that should be about laying the groundwork for a Green New Deal, put, uh, starting all the projects that can be started now and planning all the ones that have to wait a while. And then the third part is just 20 years of doing everything until it's all done. <laughs> and hopefully by the end of it, if we hit 2045, we'll have achieved all of our climate goals and we have, will have rebuilt the economy in a way that is better, happier, fairer for everyone involved in it. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm looking forward to some of the, the, the questions. Um, and thanks again for the opportunity to, to come and speak to everyone. Thanks very much, Craig. Um, that was amazing. Um, so for now, I'd like to pass over to uh, the Moss Moran team, Linda and James, um, on you go. Um, hiya, thank you for inviting us to be on the panel. So my name is James Glenn, I'm the chair of the Moss Moran Action Group. Uh, I'm Linda Holt, I'm also a councillor and I'm on the board of the Moss Moran Action Group. Councillor in Fife, that is where Moss Moran is. And, um, so we're going to give a sort of general presentation on Moss Moran just so people are aware of what the Moss Moran plan is and uh, how some of that fits into sort of the just transition. 
narrative. So we'll just take it in turns to launch it. If you give us two seconds, I need to share the screen, don't I? So hopefully everybody can see this. Can you all see it? We'll take it as an assumption I can. So anyway, the Much More Action Group, we launched in 2017. Uh, we had a big public meeting with over 200 people had attended. And this was in response to the anger felt in the communities of um, a most more has always flared since its operations in 1985 and then they had a really bad serious incident and it lasted for the 12th of June 2017 to 24th of June 2017 of flaring, noise and light pollution 24-7. So we had a public meeting and that's how we were formed. So the most more plan. I mean the important thing to say is that it's it's absolutely a grassroots um, group. It, it, it came into being as a result of residents around Mossmoran being fed up after years and years of flaring and very poor PR from, from Mossmoran and wanting something done about it. So the Mossmoran facilities is part of the North Sea Bren oil field mixture and it's split with two plants. One side is operated by Shell, another side is operated by ExxonMobil. One produces natural gas liquids and the other um, produces um, plastic for ethane stock. So the Fife natural gas liquid plants, um, they contribute to the energy mix. And um, at the Fife NGL plant, they make LPG first, sorry, LPG tanks and colour gas tanks, and they also then crack some of the product into ethane, which is then passed on to ExxonMobil. Um, so as you can see, the ExxonMobil side is highlighted, and they're the one that has the most impacts on residents, and they turn their ethane into proper ethylene stock for um, plastic productions like plastic carrier bags and so forth. Now, through their operations, there's a lot of community issues, um, noise pollution, air pollution, vibration, light pollution, health impacts, but there's also a lack of political transparency and accountability, that there was structures set in place to give communities a voice and an engagement with the plant operators. However, the way Exxon is operated by, um, they do a lot of gifts, to sort of the councillors, politicians and community councils. Corporate and hospitality as well, very lavish corporate hospitality. So they effectively bought off the politicians um, or neutralised them. So there, there wasn't really a forum for the community to express their wishes and there wasn't a forum or their, their um, problems with the plant. And, um, and, and of course the argument was always that the plant provided jobs, so shut up. Um, so we'll just keep it quite brief on the social impacts. We started, um, the local area knew what all the impacts were. We've all faced them. Uh, well aware, speakers, family members and so forth. But because of this issue of corporate hospitality, politicians didn't really take the issues forward, whether it's because they felt helpless or because they were got too cosy with the operators. So the first actions we done was actually start to collate what are people's complaints, what are the reports, and then publicly publish it on an interactive map online, which you can get through our website. Now, just a quick note about these reports. The numbers that are shown are underreported because if a resident submits one report and mentions two children or their wife or husband that are having impacts, we still Clay that as just one single report rather than a report for each child or each family member in the household. So these numbers are undervalued by up to three, four times lower than what they probably will be. Well, so, I can I'll talk about this. As a, as a result of um, all the publicity, well, there were some very severe flaring events by Exxon which upset people. They got a lot of publicity, including nationally, and they could be seen nationally. Um, 
I got a colleague to put forward a motion in Fife Council. I wasn't allowed to because I was deemed to have an interest as a member of the Mossmoran Action Group to put a, forward a motion asking for an in, independent study into all the social, environmental and health impacts from the plant because this has never been carried out. It's all very, very piecemeal. And of course, the operators and the government are always inclined to say, well, it's just anecdotal. There is no proof that it's harming doing any kind of harm, even though everybody knows that, that it is who lives there. And so um, happily that motion was put forward and then amended by the um, Labour partner in the administration in Fife Council to very tellingly include at the end um, section five a discussion with the Scottish and UK governments, the companies and trade regarding and a possible strategy for its decommissioning. So basically that is um, um, appealing to the just transition agenda. Now we have never at Mossmore in Action Group called publicly for the closure of the plant, partly because um, to do well, you know, there is there are there's a spread of opinion about that, and we we are resident led, but also to do that would be um, to um, um, divert the debate away from what the plant is at from the impacts of the plant to oh you just want to destroy jobs and um, we're not interested in that what well, and we believe that actually if there is a proper independent study into the full impacts of the plant the case for um, running down the plant and the plants and um, possibly their eventual closure will become overwhelming so um, and we have actually seen that happening on the ground because two years ago 2017 more in actually started people weren't calling for the plant to be closed down now i would say that people in the communities the fence line communities overwhelmingly are calling for the plant to be closed down one of the reasons for i mean that's because they have had to put up with the um, increasingly bad and dangerous flaring, um, which, you know, the authorities, I mean, SEPA hasn't, I mean, SEPA says they take action, but they haven't really been able to stop the flaring. They, they, the communities are still being lied to by the operators in awful PR. The Scottish government sits on its hands, hides behind SEPA, and the communities have had enough. And no doubt they're also, you know, aware of time being called on the oil and gas industry, that this is a relic from the past that we're sitting with, and they, they want it to stop. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's a groundswell. The other and very important reason why the communities are calling for the plant to be closed down and would be happy to see it closed down is because they don't actually benefit from the plant. The, the, the Mosmoran, um, as a plant, um, employs very highly skilled workers who earn you know, really good money. And of course, being earning really good money, they don't choose to live in Cowden Beath or Loch Gelly, which are areas of multiple deprivation. They live further out in much nicer areas. So the fence line communities don't really benefit beyond a few jobs as cleaners or security men. Um, so the economic impact or, on the actual areas around Moss Moran of closing it would be fairly small. I mean, there are contractors and um, the, the supply line for Moss Moran. Obviously, that will em employ people in the wider Fife area. But in the immediate area, the impact would be small. And there is a kind of terrible irony about this because Moss Moran was um, the uh, Cowden Beath Loch Ely area is a former mining area. And it's it's never really recovered from the closure of the mines. I mean, they, it was economically decimated by that, and that's why it's in one of the, 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 the top, whatever, 20 areas of multiple deprivation in, in Scotland. But um, Moss Moran, when Moss Moran came, when Shell and Exxon came along wanting to build Moss Moran in the 1980s, Five Council, well, what, it wasn't Five Council then, the earlier incarnation of Five Council, um, was very, very keen because they thought it would rescue the area from um, the, the devastation caused by the closure of the mines because there was a promise of loads of jobs, not just in, obviously in construction, but later on there was supposed to be a whole kind of series of factories making pl plastic products and using the products from Moss Moran. These, and that was going to supply thousands of jobs to the area. These factories never materialised. And the sort of few hundred jobs that Moss Moran does supply, as I say, don't actually serve the area. So there is a kind of irony now that if we're talking about just transition, um, we're not really, you know, we're talking about justice for the communities that they don't have to suffer the awful impacts of Moss Moran anymore, rather than that they are going to get a lot of 
you know, rather than worrying about them getting new jobs. Yeah, um, there won't be much impact on the local economy if most of them must go. And because these are highly skilled jobs anyway, these engineers will surely be retrained or would hope they'd be retrained but I won't take a detract from the local economy. Um, what I will say about Motion 10, which was passed um, by Five Council, so Five Council is now obliged um, to um, activate it. Um, we have, you know, they have asked for an independent investigation, which the, which the Scottish government is still um, sitting on its hands about and hiding behind CEPA over. It's also um, um, beginning, I made, made a few tiny steps to engage about compensation with the plant, but it hasn't done anything about seeking discussions about the closure of the plant. But the fact that this motion exists gives us a basis for pushing Five Council to do that. And also Mark Ruskell, the um, Green MSP, has suggested um, um, a round table with all the stakeholders and the communities and Five Council and the Scottish Government to discuss um, a just transition, the future of, of Moss Morrow. That has been, that was stalled because of the coronavirus, but we're very hopeful that, that Mark will take that forward. Also, you'll see from, from the slide that there have been two motions put forward at um, Holyrood, also calling for this independent investigation, um, and with the, the Greens also um, setting up an email campaign. So, you know, we are, and there have been a lot of questions at Hollywood as well, so we're keeping up the political pressure. And I think that one um, focus really should be um, in this, I mean, obviously with just, just trans transition, we need um, the Scottish Government to um, um, set up um, a, a body and, and put real political will into a structure requiring all companies to look at just transition who are involved in industries like oil and gas which are going to end and, and clearly um, um, Moss Moran can't be the closure of Moss Moran come or just transition for Moss Moran can't be talked about without looking at what's happening to the whole um, North Sea oil and gas network but and, and there needs to something bigger needs to come from government I think about this but before that or concurrent with that I think the Mosmoran Action Group could push very hard for just transition talks to start on Mosmoran. And we'd like to push that discussion sooner rather than later um, with the support of hopefully some of our MSPs and the reason being is when um, the plant closed down there recently their operations because that affects two boilers that had exploded um, what did emerge is Shell have put in place a plan for the next 50 years of operations at the North Sea Oil and the Fife NGL plant. So Exxon, they keep their plans quite quiet to themselves, but it's likely they'll be looking in the next 20, 30 years of their operations as well. So these plants are doing quite a lot of forward planning and thinking of where they're going to be. So without any message for the Scottish Government where they see these industries, there's not going to be any kind of just transition action coming from the government on the Mossman plan or North Sea Oil. Okay, so really we need the government to start having this dialogue as soon as possible. And that, with that, the operators to take that it dialogue forward. absolutely needs to be public because we've done FOIs and we've seen there's a great deal of private dialogue between Exxon and the Scottish government. Exxon recently, because their boilers exploded and they basically ran their their, their plant into the ground, which is why there had been all these emergency flaring events, were forced by SEPA to undertake um, major um, modernisation and, and major work on the plant. So I can't remember how much were they spending, 100 and 150, million. 150 million. Before they decided to spend that 150 million, they went to Paul Wheelhouse to basically get his support for this 150 million pound investment. And we saw that that we, we asked for minutes of the meetings and agendas and all of that. There was no talk at all with Paul Wheelhouse about a just transition. There was just Paul Wheelhouse basically um, patting them on the back about their great investment and that that should keep the communities quiet because it should um, alleviate some of the um, impacts. Um, I mean, it's not going to alleviate the impacts in a significant way and it's certainly not going to keep the communities quiet. But I think there is a big gap between what the Scottish Government says it wants to do in terms of just transition and a green agenda and about what it's actually doing on the ground with operators. And lastly, we both... Sorry, if I can just jump in. Are we able to wrap up in about a minute, if that's okay? Yeah. yeah James will wrap up. Sorry. Okay. 
So lastly, we had um, Westminster support through Leslie Laird, but unfortunately she lost her seat. And the good thing that the Leslie Laird Working Group had done is it brought the Health and Safety Executive to the table with SEPA, with the plant operators, five councillors, community councillors, and then most importantly, I had um, residents there as well. And this is where we learned about the 50 years plan of action by Shell, it's where we learned about the boiler explosion and things like that. But what we was starting to do was build a dialogue and engagement with all the parties involved. So there was more democratic accountability and transparency in the process and we were starting to enter just transition talks into that as well on how best to, well, as Linda says earlier, Exxon's a relic of a bygone age and how do we speed up that process of transition into sort of a cleaner um, industry, a better environment. But unfortunately, because of the new elections and it was um, SNP that go an MP that was elected here, that working group has ended because at the moment the Scottish Government fully supports the oil industry as they say is key to their plans for um, Scottish independence. So we feel that it has delayed some of the accountability and transparency in local government and also the wider national government and has delayed this just transition talk that needs to be happening desperately with the bus one. So we'll just quickly end it there.